Uh, sorry about the delay, guys, in that. Apparently it doesn't like um, Adobe PDFs. So I'm Bryony Moody, I'm from the University of Sheffield, and today I'm going to be talking about archaeological sequence diagrams, directed graphs, and Bayesian chronological models. So there's a lot of authors on this presentation, so I thought I'd introduce them for two reasons. One is that we're all here, so if you want to discuss anything with us, you can find us. And two, it's that it's a really interdisciplinary project. And so I thought it'd be nice to show the different disciplines coming into play. So first we have Caitlin Buck from the University of Sheffield. And her main in research interests over the years have been Bayesian chronological modeling. We have Tom Dai from Hawaii. Um, he's practiced as an archeologist for the past 50 years. And he's got a specific interest in practicing practices of archeological inference. And we have Keith May from Historic England so that's the UK public heritage body, and he's got a real interest in managing digital heritage data. Finally, there's me, um, I'm a mathematician by training, and I'm now in the first six months of my PhD. And my PhD has been formed um, to work on a project based on previous research by the other three authors. So what is the project? We're wanting to follow the process from excavating and collecting stratigraphic data through to chronological modeling. So this process starts with the stratigraphic record. So we have both spatial and temporal relationships in this, as you all well know. Then from this, we need to convert this to a temporal sequence. So if we're going to want to model chronologically, we need only the temporal relationships. For once we've got all the temporal relationships, that's not quite the end. So we then we want the chronological sequence. The reason why this extra step is needed is because there might be unnecessary temporal information in there that we can get rid of. And then we might want to include any other chronological information that we might have, so historical dating and um, phasing. And once we've got all of this, we're now in a position to form our Bayesian chronological model. So this is a process that we're really interested in. Um, actually, I kind of lied a little bit there. The stratigraphic record is separated into two parts. So there's a Harris matrix that you're all probably very familiar with. And we're not saying we're going to get rid of that, we just want to add a step after that as well, um, called a stratigraphic DAG. And so conventionally, stratigraphic data is held in a Harris matrix, um, but for chronological modelling, it's really useful to convert this information into a directed acyclic graph. And I will explain what one of them is in a minute, um, but first I'm just going to kind of go through the process. And so we're interested in this process leading up to it, so kind of the first four boxes. So this is the process, um, kind of main steps that we are interested in are the stratigraphic DAG and the sequence DAG. The reason being is that this process is really laborious at present and we'd like to make this semi-automated if possible. So what exactly is this DAG that I keep talking about? Um, so I'm just going to talk quickly about a little bit of mathematical graph theory because it might be different to the traditional graphs that you might have in your head. So a graph takes a set of objects and it demonstrates the relationships between them. So I'll give some objects you're all familiar with. So here are two contexts, labeled 300 and 301. And these nodes are used to represent these objects. And then edges are used to represent the relationships between these nodes. Now, if we add a direction to the graph, then the order of the nodes matter. So here I've used the conventional ordering um, that you use in a Harris matrix, where older deposits are at the bottom and younger at the top. So as you can see, if we swap 301 and 300 round, that clearly changes the information that this graph is portraying. A final thing is that we want it to be an acyclic graph. So acyclic graphs just don't have any cycles in them. And so you can quite see quite reasonably why you wouldn't want to cycle in this. So if I have another edge linking 301 back to 300, what I'm essentially saying is that 300 is older or younger than itself, which is just nonsensical. So we need to make sure that we have no cycles in. And a DAG is just basically a directed acyclic graph, very inventively named, but yeah, it's a graph that has them two properties. So why can't we just treat a Harris matrix as a DAG? It looks like one, it has nodes, it has edges. Well, suppose we have these four contexts, one, two, three, and four. And in this dummy example, I'm just supposing that one and three are above, one's above three, two's above four, and two's above three and one's above four. And then suppose I'm also saying that one and two were once whole contexts. So why is this not a DAG? We have two issues here. 
So this equality of the context between one and two creates a cycle, um, particularly as well because it's horizontal, you haven't got this order in, so you, you're essentially getting this temporal cycle that we don't want. Another issue here is that we have an edge connecting two other edges, and this just breaks graph theoretic conventions. So for the human eye, you might be able to interpret it, but in graph, mathematical graph theory, it just doesn't really mean anything. So to demonstrate what we're going to talk about today, um, we needed a case study. And so searching for this, um, as Keith mentioned earlier, um, it proved quite difficult when I searched for this in the UK stratigraphic archives, um, UK digital archives. So I was searching at ADS um, in York, so the Archaeological Data Service. They very kindly gave me access to a lot of their digital archives. And we still really struggled to find the appropriate data that we needed. So I resorted to the library and um, found some records from Danebury, uh, the Danebury Iron Age Hill Fort in Hampshire in England. And so Barry Cunliffe and his team um, archived their stratigraphic information exceptionally well. It was in microfiche form, so I had to go and find a machine to read it. But once I'd done that, I had these quite kind of deep stratigraphic sequences, which is what we needed. So I'm only going to focus on a really small part of one matrix from a very, very large site. The reason being is just for visual reasons on, on a presentation. Um, and the section that I'm looking at was dug from 1977 to 1978. So just a quick kind of what have we done so far, because we're quite early in the project. As Keith mentioned, I and Buck have published a paper outlining the theory behind using DAGs to represent chronological and stratigraphic information. Um, and they use Chattel Hoyek as an example in their paper, due to the deep stratigraphy, it made an interesting case study. In addition to this, open source prototype software called HM is available in Lisp, um, with very good documentation besides it for helping you to kind of learn as I've been learning to use it. So I would recommend looking at that if you are interested. So getting onto the case study now, here is the Danebury Harris matrix that I'm looking at. As I mentioned before, it is part of a Harris matrix. It's not the full one that was found in the archives. Now I know that coloring phases isn't convention in Harris matrix. There's no need for that because you structure the phases um, physically, but for consistency with the other graphs that we're gonna look at, I've just colored them. So you've got orange is phase three, blue is phase two, and pink is phase one. So now this is what I call a stratigraphic DAG. Um, so this is purely the, the physical relationships between the contexts. But we have a few issues here. So you notice here we've got the floating node, 5113. And the reason for this is that um, in the Harris matrix, it had no physical relationships with any of the other contexts. Other than that, it was a once whole context with 5512, which is now 551, sorry, which is now down here. But it actually had no physical relationship with any of the other contexts. And as adding a once whole relationship created a cycle, we've, we've excluded that. As well as this, it's removed some edges. So you can see here that um, 465 and 464 only have edges going to 476. Um, this is because if we look in the matrix, we've got um, 465 and 464, and it has an edge going down to 564, but it also has an edge going over to 476. And because 476 is itself above 564, the Harris matrix, the HM software decides that it doesn't need this edge. Um, so the edge in red, it says this isn't useful for me. Um, I'm only wanting the chronological information. And so it's edges like that that are deleted in, at this step in the process. So now we go on to a sequence tag. So those qualities in the previous slides, such as 465 and 464 um, being once whole, these are clearly useful, both temporally and um, stratigraphically. So we include them here. But this changes the structure of the DAG. So this is clearly implying physical relationships that aren't true. So here you've got 513 and 551 or above 562. So we know from what I said before that 513 wasn't actually above anything stratigraphically. We just know that it was once whole with 551. And it's because of this reason that we can't go back in the process. So here we know that either 513 or 551 or both are above 562, but we don't know which one. So this is a one way process, just a note to make. So this is now what I'm gonna call a sequence DAG. And I'll refer to this as sequence DAG one because there's more than one that we're going to look at. 
Um, so the relationships here that are represented are now purely temporal. We're not representing physical relationships here, and the reason for this is that we're wanting to get to the chronological modelling, so that's not an issue. Now the placements of the nodes, I admit, isn't the most intuitive with the phasing. This is why we've included the colouring. The placement of the nodes is determined by off-the-shelf visualisation software that is used for mathematical DAGs, and as a consequence of that, they want as little edges crossing over as possible, hence the placement of the nodes. So going back to the matrix again, we've got some other relationships here. So we've got these contemporary relationships, and obviously they're also useful when doing chronological modelling. So this leads to sequence DAG too. So here we've included both the once whole context relationships and the contemporary relationships. And so this again changes the structure of the DAG. But these two sequence DAGs are not the only possible ones. So there are actually five extra equalities that are included in the contemporary relationship, from the contemporary relationships. So what if you're less certain about some contemporary relationship than others? Well, if you want to look at the different combinations that you can have of sequence DAGs by including or not including these five different um, contemporary relationships, this produces 32 different sequence DAGs. Now, that would be quite tedious to present them all to you, so don't worry, we're just going to proceed with the two we've looked at, which are um, this one on the left, which is using all of the contemporary and once whole relationships, so that's stratigraphic DAG 2, and then stratigraphic DAG 1 just includes the once whole relationships. So this leads us on to our next stage in the process, it's a chronological DAG. So <coughs> in a chronological model, the nodes now represent known or unknown calendar dates that we want to estimate. So an example of this is the start of a phase alpha, the end of a phase beta, and a date of an object or a context theta. So these Greek letters haven't just appeared out of nowhere. They are convention in all the publications about Bayesian chronological modeling, so I've used them for consistency, basically. Um, and just a note that the chronological um, DAG does not map one-to-one -one with the sequence DAG, so we're including information and taking it away as mentioned earlier. So going back to the Harris matrix, suppose we found datable finds in the coloured context, um, so seven in total. So we can produce this chronological DAG here, where we have the start of phases, um, such as alpha M, so start of phase three is at the bottom here, the end of phases, so beta M is the end of phase M, and then anything that's dated theta N is the <coughs> date um, of a context found in context N. So here's another one. What if we want to date the context that we don't have dating, uh, we don't have dating evidence for? So we can do this. Um, so if you include them in the chronological model, then we can model these relationships. However, this should be treated with caution because we have got more parameters that we're trying to estimate, in this case, the dates of both the uh, rectangle nodes and the oval nodes. Um, we have more promises to estimate than we have data. And so the data comes from the nodes that have um, oval shape. So it's something that's possible, it's something we want to explore, but we are aware um, of its limitations. A final idea we might want to look at is about residuality. So say that we found data and evidence in context 489, but we're not convinced that it wasn't um, from an earlier context and then redeposited. So then this changes the structure again, and now theta 489 down here no longer has a relationship with um, context 488 or alpha 3, because we can't even be sure that it comes from phase 3 anymore. It might have been from an earlier phase and redeposited. So even for just one sequence DAG, so all of these chronological DAGs were formed from sequence DAG 1. And from that, we've had three chronological DAGs already that we've looked at from these hypothetical situations. So it's a problem that grows quite quickly. So I mentioned at the start of the talk that this is the process um, that we kind of go through, but I basically fibbed a little. Um, and it's actually something that's a little bit more like this. So we start off with the Harris matrix. We then proceed to the stratigraphic DAG. But then we have multiple sequence DAGs that we can consider. And from each sequence DAG, we have multiple chronological DAGs that we can consider. So this sequence DAG number N here, there's N number of sequence DAGs. In our case, I said there were 32. How big does this problem scale up? So what does N equal? Well, given K 
possible equality, so K possible equal relationships in time that you may want to consider for your chronological model, um, that gives you two to the K possible sequence DAGs. So how big does that grow? So when does it become, say, for example, a million? That's a big number. So just 20 possible relationships to consider gives you over a million possible sequence DAGs. So you can see that it grows quite quickly. So what are the interests of the project? As I said, I've just started my PhD. Um, we're quite early in. We want to make the graph drawing software as intuitive as possible. We appreciate that, for example, the placement of the nodes with the phasing isn't particularly intuitive. Um, so we want to look into considering how we'll manage that. We want to write an interactive interface to allow um, archaeologists to combine chronologically equal nodes and delete chronologically unnecessary edges. And then we also want to allow them to be able to identify key nodes with date and evidence and those without but that they want to estimate dates for. And then we will also need um, software to render the chronological DAGs ready for input into existing Bayesian calibration software, such as BCAL and OxCal. So at practice, standard pres at present standard practice involves taking um, one chronological sequence and deciding that that's your main one. But as I mentioned before, there's a possibility of considering multiple different sequence DAGs, chronological DAGs, and so on. So how are we going to manage that? So we're aware that we're going to need to, um, so we're going to want a method for automatically converting chronological DAGs into priors, ready for input into Bayesian chronological modelling. We'll also want automatic tools to allow the archaeologists to identify the most plausible graphs and proceed with them. So that might be uh, that will probably be statistical tools, but that's something we need to consider. And then we also need a development of the standard of archiving competing stratigraphic sequence and chronological DAGs because there just isn't one at present. So thank you very much for listening. Just some quick references. So uh, this is the pa number one the paper that's been established for the theory behind what we've been talking about. Uh, number two is the link to the GitHub page with the software and all the corresponding kind of tutorials you need for it. And then also, if you're interested in Bayesian chronological modeling, um, then chapter nine in this book is a really good um, way to kind of get into it. And yeah, so thank you very much for listening.